Well, uh, thank you so much. Uh, it's a privilege to be with you all today. Um, I'm Steve Hudak. I'm hailing from Dallas, Texas. I'm a reconstructive urologist at uh, UT Southwestern Medical Center here. And I'd like to thank uh, Katie for putting this together and, and Dr. Eric Richter, who's a longtime colleague from our time in the military, uh, as well as the whole board um, at IVU Med for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all today. Uh, it goes without saying that uh, this pandemic has created uh, uh, unprecedented strain on all of us in a personal and, and a, a financial and a medical and a, you know, really all aspects of our lives and, and probably the need, as Katie and I were talking about, to cancel IVU meds and similar missions um, abroad has really had a profound impact, um, uh, which is probably hard to measure. Um, but nonetheless, I'm glad that IVU Med and others um, you know, are supporting uh, opportunities to meet and collaborate uh, and to teach and to learn uh, in this fashion. And obviously technology has been helpful as well. And so I'm uh, proud to be a part of it today and um, I'm excited to uh, pre present this to you. This is a quite a lengthy talk, so I kind of pared it down to, I hope, uh, you know, 45 minutes or so. And uh, um, uh, however you'd like to run it, uh, Fred, if you want to just kind of burn through and then if there's questions afterwards or certainly feel free to, to interrupt me if you'd like to do questions during. It really makes no difference to me and I'm happy to kind of entertain uh, uh, the format and whichever works best, you know, for you and, and everyone who's joining us today. Um, so I have no disclosures that I need to, that I need to talk about. Um, so to speak about stricture, um, I think you need to look a little bit into uh, what is the impact of this, of this diagnosis? Um, and there's a number of studies, uh, I'm going to cite here a couple that are a bit dated that looked specifically into the burden of stricture disease in the United States and found that if we look for uh, how often that a stricture leads to someone being admitted to the hospital, it's quite rare. Um, however, if you look at the outpatient setting, um, you see as many as 1% of patients uh, going to the doctor will have a, a stricture as being part of their medical complaint. And so um, this is kind of common enough that it worth, is worth mentioning, especially with urologists. Um, uh, the incidence of stricture increases with age, and you see this uh, statistic here from US data, uh, kind of showing a precipitous rise around the time of BPH diagnosis. And so we frequently uh, recognize this, that um, uh, as uh, urological uh, complaints become more common with age, then BPH is more common, but also uh, during the evaluation of BPH, um, it's when incidental diagnosis of some of these strictures are identified. Um, the incidence of uh, strictures is actually more common uh, in the United States among those that have non-private payers. So those that are treated by the Medicaid system or treated at county hospitals that don't have insurance, strictures are more common. Uh, and this is seen in developing nations as well, perhaps due to uh, less resources uh, and uh, more challenges in the medical care arena, although this is not entirely known. Um, uh, strictures cost a lot of money, uh, regardless of where you are on the planet and, and, and what uh, payer models are. Um, they currently car certainly carry a burden, but here in the United States, even data here that's uh, about 20 years old, we saw that almost a quarter of a billion dollars were sent, spent on caring for patients that have strictures. Uh, and this represents about 10% of the number of stone disease. And so if you just think about the, how much more common stone disease is, and yet uh, the cost of strictures uh, are uh, about 10% of that, I think that's quite remarkable. Um, it's been tried to kind of quantify this in the United States in terms of how much does it cost on the per patient level and it's estimated to be about $6,000 per year per patient, although this is obviously uh, quite variable depending on uh, the degree of the stricture, the treatment that's chosen, uh, and, and then any complications that may arise. Um, it's not surprising that those that have strictures will have a high uh, degree or a high incidence of other genitourinary problems, uh, predominantly a urinary tract infection, which probably is a leading cause for presenting to uh, their, their urologist or other physicians, um, but also incontinence, um, probably most commonly due to post-void urinary dribbling due to sequestration of the urine behind the stricture, which then dribbles out with time after the void, uh, but also other types of incontinence related to either the primary stricture or treatment of it uh, with time. 
Now, um, strictures are complicated. They lead to substantial complications. And this Canadian study from a few years back tried to detail uh, the complications that arose. Um, and it might uh, not be surprising to you that LUTs or low urinary tract symptoms um, was the presenting a diagnosis, the presenting reason uh, for the stricture in more than half um, uh, uh, and was present in the majority of patients, even it was when it wasn't primary, so it was the most common. Um, it's also not surprising that acute retention would be uh, sometimes the most common reason for presentation or urinary tract infection, as we discussed previously. But also there's a number of much more dramatic and profound complications um, seen in as many as three to 4% in very challenging circumstances, such as necrotizing infections, or even renal failure. So you can see that these complications are not inconsequential um, and can lead to substantial morbidity uh, um, even if treated. Now with regards to the anatomy of the strictures and the etiology of the strictures, bulbar strictures are definitely the most common and the type of bulbar strictures really depend on the location around the world. So within developing, uh, developed uh, countries rather, Really, it's the idiopathic strictures, and this has been the case in Canada and in the United States, across Europe and Australia, where studies after studies <clears throat> have shown that um, about half of the time, we really don't identify the cause of the stricture, which is sometimes disappointing or unsatisfying for patients, but it just is the way that it is. And then iatrogenic strictures are quite common as well. Uh, in developing countries, uh, it's, uh, Traumatic strictures are much more common, and there are two types of traumatic strictures uh, that I like to consider. Uh, primary traumatic strictures are those when an external injury actually injures the urethra, and that's obvious. But what I've termed as secondary traumatic strictures uh, would be, for example, a patient that has, is, is injured by a gunshot wound or a severe car accident and may not have uh, a bona fide urethral injury, but rather is in the hospital for a long period of time with a catheter placed. And if it's not uh, appropriate catheter care, um, uh, then we'll frequently see complex secondary strictures due to the trauma, but not from the pr trauma primarily, but rather due to the long period of catheterization during that patient's long recovery from these traumatic injuries. Um, and then this is obviously a form of iatrogenic stricture, uh, which we, we see uh, in uh, large numbers um, as well. Now the pendulous urethra is a bit different. Um, lichen sclerosis is much more common within the pendulous stricture or within the pendulous urethra. Obviously hypospadias, either when treated or sometimes when not treated or as a complication from treatment can lead to complex pendulous strictures. And then again, iatrogenic strictures due to instrumentation most commonly uh, due to uh, uh, urethroscopy, transurethral resection of the prostate uh, or uh, again, chronic catheterization, as discussed, can lead to these iatrogenic strictures. Within the posterior urethra, again, it's trauma that uh, predominates due to pelvic fracture, which we'll talk about a bit later, um, and then iatrogenic, but this is much more common, not necessarily due to the long effects of the catheter, but rather to the effects of prostate treatment, we, be it either from transurethral resection of the prostate, open simple prostatectomy, open radical prostatectomy, or the various forms of radiation that can be used to treat prostate cancer, including other ablative therapies such as cryotherapy. So these can cause rather complex posterior iatrogenic problems, which again, we'll discuss a bit later. So with regards to identifying uh, or predicting where the etiology is, it really comes down to the anatomy. And so I'd like to kind of use this retrograde urethrogram as an example to illustrate the seven different regions of the urethra, all of which develop different strictures. So um, the first uh, region, if you will, is the bladder neck, and we almost only see uh, problems of this part of the urethra um, after pro benign prostate treatment, namely bladder neck contracture after transurethral resection of the prostate. Fortunately, the prostatic urethra is relatively immune to stricture development. Um, we don't see idiopathic or iatrogenic strictures in this location. It really is only patients that have had uh, extensive damage from radiation therapy that will develop stenosis within the prostatic urethra. It's really not seen in really any other uh, circumstance. The membranous urethra, again, prostatic, or sorry, uh, uh, pelvic fracture urethral injuries lead to problems at the membranous urethra and also problems due to the stenosis of the anastomosis after radical prostatectomy, 
on the bladder neck as opposed to the membranous urethra. We can see stenoses in this area. The bulbar urethra extends from the membranous to the penis scrotal junction. And again, as discussed previously, these can be iatrogenic strictures, commonly idiopathic strictures in the developed world, and then traumatic strictures as well, namely due to straddle type injuries and a fall from a stride uh, uh, mechanism. Uh, again, the pendulous urethra from the, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, suspensory ligament on uh, as shown here. And the fossa navicularis, again, is uh, the, the distal most aspect um, of the urethra, um, which again is commonly seen uh, either uh, iatrogenic strictures, uh, namely after transurethral section of the prostate or prolonged catheterization. And then finally, the urethral meatus, which will commonly see meal stenosis um, in congenital uh, uh, varieties as well as from iatrogenic causes as well. So I'd like to share with you this document, uh, which you may be aware of. This was the American Neurological Association's uh, uh, first ever guideline statement about male urethral stricture. Um, there is open access to this guideline through the website as shown here. And so I'd invite you to uh, uh, use this as a reference and I'll be referring back to this document uh, throughout the course of the talk with the number of statements um, that were published in this. So I think this is a great reference for all of us that uh, treat stricture patients. Uh, and I'd invite you to use that as well. So how do we evaluate stricture patients? Well, it starts uh, with uh, non-invasively, of course, and a focused uh, a history um, should be used to evaluate um, uh, for common uh, uh, urinary complaints. I like to use the AUA symptom index. This evaluates things such as frequency, urgency, nocturia, slow stream, sense of complete, incomplete emptying. Um, but there's a number of more kind of insidious lower urinary tract symptoms which will not be captured within these common prostate disease uh, questionnaires. And so specifically, you might wanna ask about if they have pain when they urinate or those might, that might have splayed urinary stream or post void dribbling as we discussed previously. And then it's also important to talk about sexual function. Um, it may not be the reason that they presented, but it's good to document what degree of sexual function they have before any treatments of strictures. And then also talk about uh, ejaculatory function. It's common that men that have an impaired urinary stream will have an impaired uh, ejaculatory uh, stream as well, which could uh, obviously affect their fertility function as well. So this should be queried um, at the initial evaluation for the stricture patient. <clears throat> A fo focused examination for stricture patients so should look uh, carefully at the genital skin, evaluating for any areas of deep pigmentation or fibrosis such as we see in the common condition lichen sclerosis. The meatus should be closely and carefully examined to see if that is involved. Um, the abdomen should be examined, uh, particularly the lower abdominal area for scars, especially if a suprapubic tube uh, placement is planned. Um, and then a neurological evaluation is important as well, namely to identify the potential for concomitant neurological symptoms, which may be causing uh, impaired bladder function, which obviously could, 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 com could complicate uh, any evaluation or treatment for patients that have uh, uh, strictures being treated as well. And then finally, orthopedic examination is important in those that have had some form of traumatic injury, uh, particularly pelvic fracture injury. And this is important uh, in any patient that's gonna uh, be uh, uh, planned placement into the lithotomy position if they have uh, significant um, limited mobility at the level of their hips or thighs. This could impair uh, safe access to the perineum. Uh, and so this should be assessed uh, early on in the course. Uh, a flow, urofluorometry, as well as post void residual check uh, is uh, the mainstay non-invasive evaluation. And here you see the classic flow pattern in a patient that has fixed obstruction from a stricture where you see a flat and, and very low flow in this case uh, barely above three milliliters per second. And so that's a non-invasive and straightforward way, um, albeit somewhat non-specific. Now with regards to definitively diagnosing the stricture and then better characterizing it, the mainstay is the retrograde urethrogram. Uh, and this is within guideline uh, number three within the statement uh, from the AUA. Um, it's certainly appropriate to evaluate the urethra with uh, a cystoscopy, although you will only see the leading edge of the stricture, so you won't get full evaluation. Um, some use um, sonal urethrography, so this involves placing an ultrasound probe 
on the penis or the perineum and then distending the urethra retrograde with a saline or lubricant. Uh, it's a bit challenging to do uh, and is a bit hard, uh, a bit more onerous than a retrograde urethrogram, but can be import, uh, appropriate as well. And then MRI can be used, but I reserve it, reserve it really for cases um, that are much more complicated, particularly in those in whom you suspect a urethral carcinoma or in whom those patients that might have a rectourethral fistula. Um, uh, so again, is used selectively and, uh, and only in those cases. Now, the point of evaluating it with any of these modalities is to determine the length and the location um, of the stricture. And it's essential that we do this before treating basically any patient um, that's being treated in a non-urgent scenario. So if you're evaluating the patient in the office, and you have the time uh, to do so, it's really a must to identify the location and the length of the stricture. And we'll talk about why that's important in just a second. So again, urethrogram uh, is the mainstay evaluation uh, 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 modality of choice. And these are kind of the, the key components of the urethrogram. Now, the position is important to have them in the oblique position here. So usually about 30 to 45 degrees up, you can put a bump or a pillow uh, up underneath their buttock on one side. And the reason is, is it allows you to stretch the urethra obliquely. And then the x-ray plane comes in here and that allows the urethra to be on stretch uh, and perpendicular to the x-ray beam and therefore not underestimating the length of the stricture and still providing good uh, anatomic clarity as to where the, lo the location of the stricture is. Um, next, it's important to include the distal urethra, uh, and I like these adapters. These are made by Cook Medical. Um, they can be attached to any Lorlock syringe, uh, and you can see with the tapered tip, uh, they provide good occlusion at the level of the meatus, uh, but there's a number of different products uh, uh, that are available uh, for accomplishing this goal. Um, and then you want to give good stretch to the urethra. So here you see uh, the occlusion at the level of the meatus, um, and if you want to avoid radiating your hand, you can make a small uh, kind of tourniquet out of a piece of gauze around the glands uh, and then give good axial stretch on the urethra, thus fully kind of extending the urethra and then carefully injecting the contrast. You want to make sure to have the appropriate amount of injection pressure. You see here on the left side of the screen that if you use too much pressure, it'll actually extravasate outside of the urethra and into the corpus spongiosum and even into the penile vasculature. And so it makes it very difficult to see where the urethra is and could cause pain for the patient and perhaps infection. Conversely, if you don't have enough pressure, you really can't tell at all where the stricture is. And this patient may have a completely normal urethra or may not, and you can't tell with the appropriate amount of pressure. But here in this final example, you see with steady, slow uh, pressure along with occlusion, you get excellent delineation of the entire anterior and posterior urethra um, you see the filling defect from the verum montanum, and then even filling into the bladder. And so this is what you want to shoot for uh, to have the appropriate amount of pressure to get the best uh, anatomical information from the retrograde urethrogram. Now, sometimes patients, in my experience, particularly young, more anxious patients, will be really tight down on the pelvic floor. And when you see that down here, uh, you see they don't really have good relaxation of the sphincter, and you can't really tell where the stricture uh, begin or where the stricture ends and where their sphincter begins. Uh, and so if you're able to kind of uh, encourage them to relax their pelvic floor, uh, you see here that uh, you could see good flow through the uh, posterior urethra and kind of more uh, accurate determination of where that stricture is versus more normal urethra once that pelvic floor can relax. And then finally, it comes down to interpretation of the study. Uh, and the first and most important aspect of, is it, is, of it is it an adequate study? And so things that we look at to see if it's an adequate study, again, good illumination of the anterior, posterior urethra, filling into the bladder, as well as the position. Here you see, um, you, you cannot see on the patient's left the obturator foramen because it's actually rotated in plane with the x-ray image. And so this is what you wanna see. You wanna see no foramen on one side and a good, uh, good foramen on the contralateral side. And that's how you prove you're in the ideal position for uh, uh, appropriate interpretation of the uh, retrograde urethrogram. Uh, once you've said that, uh, determined that it's an appropriate study, then we're looking at length, location, and severity. And so specifically for this patient, um, 
for length, we would say that is approximately three centimeters or so. And that's really from where the normal urethra uh, begins and where the stricture ends, okay? So I would say this is about a three centimeter segment. Um, with regards to location, um, uh, again, there's some subjectivity here, but I would say that this begins in the proximal bulb where it's before the turn outside of the uh, perineum uh, and then into the mid bulb here. Uh, and so I'd say that this is a proximal to mid, mid bulb stricture. And then if I were having to, uh, you know, put into my documentation how I would say the severity was, I would say that it's focally nearly obliterative, but then has a widening proximal segment before you get to the normal urethra. So I think that if we develop a kind of a common accepted lexicon that allows us to communicate appropriately amongst urologists, um, it is uncommon for radiologists, in my experience, to have this level of detail in their determination. So I certainly would recommend, as the urologist caring for the patient, that you review the study uh, yourself, because many radiologists are not uh, comfortable doing so. So again, it takes some time and some logistics to do a urethrogram. And so I think it's a little bit different when the patient is being evaluated in an urgent scenario. And so this is in the patient that's in acute retention or uh, you need to have a catheter placed for another lengthy non-urological surgery. So in this case, a rug is just simply not feasible. And so guideline number five tells us that we can treat these patients endoscopically at the time of recognition or place a suprapubic tube. And the decision between that just really just depends on the circumstances. So here we see a non-obliterative uh, kind of band of scar. These patients respond well in an urgent circumstance to endoscopic treatment. But if there's something more uh, dramatic, such as this patient with extensive radiant necrosis, clearly this is not going to be managed with dilation and perhaps placing a suprapubic tube in these urgent scenarios is much more, uh, much more appropriate. Now, um, there are those that have termed the, uh, the, the, the coined the term urethral rest. And this uh, uh, has been coined by my mentor, Alan Morey, who basically uh, uh, details what happens um, when you have a catheter in place or, where, or when you don't. So when the catheter is in place, it actually prevents that area of the urethra from completely healing. And as such, you cannot, don't allow that scar to completely mature and that stricture to completely delineate itself. So what urethral rest is, is it's a one to three month period where you do not instrument the urethra anymore. And it allows this maturation of scar to completely occur. And so in a patient that presents with a catheter in place, we recommend removing that catheter. If they're doing any forms of self-dilation, you stop that. And then if they go into retention, then you place a suprapubic tube. Because until this urethral rest has occurred, you really have no idea how long that stricture is gonna be. And it's very challenging and, and, and perhaps inappropriate to plan an open reconstruction until this process has completely played out. Now, um, why is it important to evaluate comprehensively uh, these patients? Well. Uh, you need to identify the length, location, and severity of the stricture. It's appropriate to, to evaluate the severity of the impact of, of these symptoms. Some patients will not be bothered by them at all, um, but some may be uh, profoundly bothered by even a mild stricture. Um, comor comorbid conditions uh, such as recurrent urinary tract infections or incontinence as we discussed previously. And then also to delineate patient expectations. Again, if a patient has minimal bother, it can be hard to uh, kind of convince them that you can improve their condition when they don't feel like they have a condition to begin with. And then also remembering that our de definition of success as a surgeon is most commonly focused in on the caliber of their urethra, but that may not matter much to a patient. What matter may more to a patient um, is, the, is the urinary symptoms they may have or any complications such as pain or sexual problems from the reconstruction. So it's important to really kind of clarify this before treating these patients. So let's move on to talk a little bit about how these patients are managed. And it really comes down to, are we fixing these surgically or treating them endoscopically? And really kind of philosophically, this uh, can kind of be boiled down to, do we want to completely eliminate a problem or do we want to manage a disease in perpetuity? And we'll talk a little bit more about this. Of course, there are pros and cons. Um, urethroplasty, um, it's effective. Um, it's usually definitive. And with modern techniques, it's quite safe. Um, but the cons are it's a very technical operation uh, that does have a substantial learning curve. Um, it does have a recovery period. Even if it's only a month, this can be uh, important uh, for some men uh, 
uh, that cannot take time off work or other activities. And there are complications that, that are possible and these should not be uh, kind of understated. What about doing endoscopic treatment such as VIU or endoscopic dilation? Well, it's very easy. The catheter doesn't need to be in place for very long, if at all. The recovery is short, but uh, except in select scenarios, it is rarely curative. Um, and in some cases, as I'll talk about later, it can be counterproductive. And so it's really the balance between these two approaches, uh, which is uh, really uh, in the hands of the urologist to help uh, or navigate their patients through. Now, how do we manage these in the US? Well, really not that well. Um, uh, this is uh, a, a data that's a, becoming a bit dated now. Uh, but when we look at uh, Medicare data here in the States, we really see that urethroplasty is chosen in the minority of patients with 90% or more undergoing treatment uh, with endoscopic approaches. Uh, similarly, uh, in our veterans administration system in which one that's uh, a single payer system, even, even then only about 5% of strictures uh, were managed uh, definitively with urethroplasty. Well, why is this? I mean, nobody really knows. My theory on it is, is that if we undermanage a condition such as kidney cancer, uh, the effects are quite dramatic because when that patient progresses, uh, they will have uh, catastrophic implications of progressive cancer and ultimately death. But if you undermanage a stricture with endoscopic treatments, the only thing that really happens is the, trick, the stricture can recur and the patient comes back to you and then you just can undermanage it again. And the complications of doing that with time can be quite insidious. And that's why I can kind of create this cycle of repeat endoscopic treatment uh, that is much less profound than under treating something such as a overwhelming infection or even cancer. Um, when American uh, urologists were surveyed, they found that the majority treated uh, strictures almost once a month or more, uh, but again, endoscopic techniques predominated and really uh, urethroplasty use was limited. Amongst American urologists at the time of publication of this study, almost 60% never performed urethroplasty and very few did more than once a month. And all of them really, or almost all of them recommended urethroplasty only after uh, there have been repeated failures from endoscopic techniques. I would say that this is really an antiquated approach to take and really should be abandoned. And, and fortunately, at least in the United States, there's been kind of a, uh, an eruption of fellowship programs and training programs, many of whom uh, collaborate with uh, IVU Med and their partners. And it's led to a explosion of, of education about urethral reconstruction uh, techniques. And in this study that was uh, published a few years back, we've begun to see within the United States a precipitous fall in those patients that are having endoscopic treatment with uh, a conversely a slow rise in the utilization of formal urethroplasty. So time will tell if this will continue and if these curves will pass one another, but I certainly think that this is a favorable trend with regards to the appropriate and uh, decreased utilization of endoscopic treatments with the increase of urethroplasty. So what do the AUA guidelines say about uh, internal urethrotomy or other endoscopic treatments versus urethroplasty? Well, guideline seven tells us that for the short bulbar stricture, particularly for the type of stricture that you see here, either endoscopic treatment or urethroplasty is appropriate. But for essentially all other patients, really urethroplasty is, is, is the appropriate first step. This includes patients that have failed endoscopic treatment in the past, those that have had uh, a minimally invasive treatment such as a meatotomy that is then uh, restenosed, those that have a penile stricture, such as a, a stricture that you see here, these basically never respond to endoscopic treatment long-term, and so it should be avoided. And then for long or obliterative strictures, such as you see here, these cannot be treated endoscopically, and thus urethroplasty is obviously uh, the, the appropriate choice in these cases. And then uh, the, the question arises, well, what if uh, urethroplasty is not in your skill set? Well, uh, again, the guidelines have make a strong statement here saying these patients should be referred to centers when these, where these are performed. Again, this may not always, this could be a challenging thing uh, depending on where you are and what your resources are. Uh, but again, we should strive for this uh, and hopefully that this is the goal. Uh, and I know that it's the goal of the IVU Med uh, organization to equip urologists around the world with these uh, uh, techniques uh, so these can be performed uh, in virtually any uh, center where urology expertise is present.
So what's the rationale for this? Well, basically, um, those that have, again, these short idiopathic and untreated bulbar strictures, we get at best a 70% success rate with endoscopic treatments. But basically, for all other scenarios, the six long-term success of endoscopic treatments really approaches zero. So this includes the obliterative and longer strictures, the pendulous strictures, uh, prior endoscopic failures, and then other etiologies such as hypospadias trauma or lichen sclerosis. And when a treatment uh, outcome approaches zero uh, or success rate approaches zero, again, that therein lies the rationale for abandoning it. Now, there may be exceptions uh, to this despite these profound um, success rate disparities. And uh, some patients are, are, are strictly poor candidates. If a patient has extensive cardiac disease or other comorbidities, in which case even a short uh, anesthetic is not appropriate, um, uh, again, then it's not appropriate to risk these patients' lives. And for these patients, as a salvage maneuver, you might wanna add self-catheterization uh, uh, if they wanna try to avoid permanent urinary diversion to help to kind of maintain the patency after endoscopic treatment should they not be candidates for uh, endos or for formal urethroplasty. And then I found that with time, due to the sensitive nature of uh, the genitalia, some just desire to not have uh, treatment performed at all. And these can be tough patients to counsel because uh, hopefully we're trying to prevent them from having some of the, the profound uh, complications that I detailed previously. So what is the impact of these ongoing endoscopic treatments that fail? Well, numerous studies over the years have shown that patients that have had numerous endoscopic treatments over time, when they do go on to require urethroplasty, the failure rate of subsequent urethroplasty is higher. So there is things to be lost there. A number of authors have shown that the cost on a medical system and a patient is increased when you repeatedly do less invasive treatments versus a single more invasive treatment um, that this, uh, the cost uh, 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 a waterfall really kind of goes uh, in favor of urethroplasty after two or more endoscopic treatments. Um, in a study that I did during my fellowship with Dr. Mori, we showed that when you do ongoing endoscopic treatments, it delays the uh, time to cure. In some cases, a decade or more uh, was lost in patients uh, who um, were not referred for urethroplasty right away. And then it even increases stricture complexity. The thought is that ongoing endoscopic attempts at treatment leads to increased spongia fibrosis, longer strictures, um, and then uh, many times they'll then extend from the bulb and into the pendulous urethra. And as such, in ca uh, many cases that may have been amenable to an excisional approach then require a more complex treatment such as a flap or a graft, and therein lies the, the likelihood of increased failure rates. And really, this comes back to where I started this section, where it basically converts a curable condition into a chronic disease. And so uh, it is my uh, uh, assertion um, um, that the appropriate utilization of urethroplasty can effectively cure a condition uh, that would otherwise need to be managed long term. Uh, and I hope uh, um, we can, you know, kind of provide you with some tools to uh, uh, equip you uh, for such uh, uh, management. And really, this is what we're trying to avoid. Um, this was a patient that had a super pubic tube for four years, multiple attempts at endoscopic treatment. This is a patient that I managed on a mission to Central America. And you see the end stage result of this was the development of a urethrocutaneous fistula due to ongoing endoscopic treatment attempts. And unfortunately for this man at this point, really his only option at that point in time was to perform a perineal urethrostomy, which again was a definitive and appropriate treatment. But the question is if this man was treated earlier on in the course, could he have been salvaged with a much uh, more and or a much more uh, effective option and one that is less debilitating and less uh, disfiguring. And so that's really kind of the question that I would leave with you today with regards to the appropriate selection of endoscopic versus uh, reconstruction related techniques. So let's move along and, and talk a little bit about urethral reconstruction. Um, I was privileged uh, to be asked to, to submit this chapter, which was published a couple years back in Hinman's Atlas of Urologic Surgery, along with my mentor, uh, Alan Mori. And I'm gonna be using a number of the figures uh, uh, from this, uh, this text uh, in my talk today. So there's a number of anterior urethral reconstruction techniques, and certainly we don't have time to detail each of those. But just to lay them out for you here, for short strictures, you can excise the, the uh, strictured area and do a primary anastomosis. Uh, 
either in a tra transecting or a non-transecting technique, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, if it's too long for uh, excision, then you need to bring in either a graft or a flap. Um, a, a graft graft is usually preferred to start, and this can be placed either ventrally, uh, it can be placed dorsally, or for severe strictures, it can be placed both dorsally and ventrally, uh, depending on the severity and location of the stricture. An augmented anastomosis is where you have a short area of obliteration, but a much longer area of more mild or moderate stricture. And in this case, you excise the, the, the obliterated area, do a one-sided anastomosis, and then do an onlay uh, or an augment augmentation for the remainder of the stricture. And so this is a great technique for patients that have a complex uh, kind of uh, uh, um, a heterogeneous stricture that requires multiple techniques combined. Flaps are still appropriate uh, in select scenarios for patients that have penile strictures and no areas of diseased skin due to lichen sclerosis. And then in the most severe strictures, particularly those of the more distal anterior urethra, sometimes it requires a multi-stage approach uh, uh, to, to, uh, to uh, lead to uh, successful outcomes for patients with the most complex degrees of anterior strictures. So the decision-making between these techniques really comes back to what we talked about with what we want to identify with the rug, and that's uh, location and length of the stricture. And the reason that that matters is if we look at the anatomy of the bulbar urethra and the bulbar spongiosum, first of all, the bulbar urethra, because it's located deep down behind the scrotum and perineum, it has more, more mobility and flexibility thus facilitating excision and primary anastomosis. But also, as you can see in this picture here from Campbell's, that it has a more robust ventral spongiosum. So you see an eccentrically located urethra indicated by the yellow circle uh, or the yellow oval and then this robust ventral spongiosum. So this allows very simple ventral placement of a graft, okay? Now in the pendulous urethra, this is not the case. We see less sponge and more centrally located urethra. And it's for that reason that we are more likely to place our graft dorsally uh, and then supported by the corpora cavernosa um, as you kind of extend uh, more distal down on the urethral axis. Now severity matters too. Uh, the narrower your stricture, the wider your graft. And that's simply due to the geometric truth or the ge geometric reality of the fact that the ultimate caliber of the urethra is determined by the, com the composite width of the plate and the graft, which then rolls into a tube. And so the narrower your plate or the more severe your stricture, the wider your graft needs to be. And then if you have a complete obliteration of the urethra, then clearly this won't support an onlay graft. And it's for that reason that you either need to excise and then replace the urethra, either due to a mobilization and an anastomosis, or due to a combination of techniques with grafts, flaps, or stage techniques, when you have complete elimination of the urethral lumen, resulting in obliteration. Um, if a patient has a history of previously failed urethroplasty, it can be helpful to know which technique that was, was tried previously and failed, um, because many times if one technique failed, we will not go back and try to do the same thing and repeat the same mistakes, but rather kind of bring in a, more, a different technique and try to uh, exploit uh, the benefits of the technique that had not yet been used. So I wanna go through a couple of cases here. I hope these are in, in, uh, informative for everyone. Uh, and we'll go through three representative cases one by one. So this patient was 45 years old. He had really minimal symptoms, um, but the stricture was initially recognized when he was having a neck surgery a few months back. And so um, they couldn't get a catheter in. Um, they saw it was a relatively mild stricture. They dilated it, placed a catheter. And now two months later, the stricture had rapidly recurred. And here we see a representative urethrogram. So this patient now has a one centimeter idiopathic stricture with relatively limited impact on him, but it has pay failed a previous dilation and he's had no prior urethral surgery. So this is really the ideal patient for an excision and primary anastomosis technique. Um, and so this uh, operation begins with a midline perineal incision, uh, Collie's fascia is incised, and then reflected using a self-retaining perineal retractor. There's a number of these that are available, both disposable and reusable. Uh, the bubble spongiosis muscle is identified and then split in the midline is shown here. And then when you place those muscular edges 
within your self-retaining retractor, you really see you have excellent uh, and complete identification and visualization of the entirety of the bulbar urethra from the perineal body up near the penis scrotal junction. Um, you then can uh, lift and elevate the bulbar urethral and spongiosal complex up off of the corporal bodies and then sharply divide the attachments to the corporal bodies. This is a relatively bloodless plane uh, due to uh, the anatomy of the region. And then when you place a vessel loop around it, again, basically, here's the urogenital diaphragm or the bulbal membranous junction, if you will. And this has been completely mobilized all the way up to and then underneath the retractor to the, to the, to the uh, penis scrotal junction and then retract it away. And what this allows is precise identify and identification of the stricture and then control. So here we have these vascular clamps that have been placed over it after we used a cystoscope to identify where that short obliteration was and then precisely uh, identify the scar and then carefully control the urethra for transection and complete excision of the scar. And you can see how well these vascular clamps control bleeding from the spongiosum uh, uh, and allow uh, excellent really identification, identification and control of these cut urethral edges. Um, at that point in time, you wanna be careful to remove any residual scarred spongiosum and urethral lumen and then provide a, a uh, kind of a careful uh, spatulation. We like to spatulate on the dorsal side distally and then on the uh, ventral aspect proximally, okay? And then uh, place your sutures uh, 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 circumferentially here, as you see on the proximal aspect, somewhere between eight and 12 absorbable sutures, and then place them distally through the cut edge and the anastomosis, parachute down uh, that anastomosis over a catheter and then tie those snugly. Now in the bulb, like I said, remember the urethra is located uh, eccentrically here on the dorsal half. And so what we like to do is a, a modified two layer anastomosis where on the dorsal half of the clock face, these are placed in one, one layer, but on the ventral half, they're placed just through the urethra. So that prevents obliteration of this otherwise highly vascular corp and, and, and abundant corpus spongiosum and perhaps allows blood flow across this uh, uh, anastomosis after it heals, okay? And then what that allows for is a two-layer anastomosis with a, with a running spongioplasty after this uh, deeper layer uh, has been tied down. Now, the beauty of excision and primary anastomosis is that when you get a VCUG a couple of weeks later, it basically restores a completely normal anatomy to the area. And you'll find that radiologists can note, will just say normal urethra because they cannot even detect that anything was really done there to begin with. Um, and the data really has told us study after study, year after year, that the success rate uh, is about as close to perfect as we can obtain with any surgery within reconstructive urology, approaching 95%. Fortunately, complications are rare and there is limited impact on sexual function. Um, now, however, there has been great, uh, much enthusiasm for a new technique uh, developed at multiple centers, but really popularized uh, by uh, Professors Andrich and Mundy in the UK uh, known as the non-transecting technique, where this ventral spongiosum is spared and the urethral stricture is approached dorsally here and just excised on the dorsal half, leaving this ventral spongiosum intact. Um, this may have an, a less impact on sexual function. However, I can attest to the fact that it is a much more difficult technique uh, to teach and to learn, but it may be very helpful for patients in whom you do not want to threaten the blood supply of the urethra by transecting it completely, including the sponge, such as those patients that have multiple strictures, those have had previous urethroplasty or other conditions that you can see here. So I think there's a lot of promise to this technique and I do like to employ it in select circumstances. Now, what if the stricture is too long for such an excisional technique, such as this man uh, who has bothersome symptoms for a longer bulbar stricture, He's had no prior urethral surgery. And really, in my hands, the uh, ventral buccal mucosa graft on lay is the mainstay here. So again, here we see the same exposure uh, obtained. And then you make a ventral midline 
longitudinal uh, urethrotomy, full thickness through the sponge and the urethra. Stay sutures are nice to include and tamponade the spongiosal bleeding. And then you see this scarred urethral plate, which results. You harvest a buccal mucosa graft from the cheek, and then you see this nice wide buccal graft, which has been anastomosed to one side of the urethral plate uh, with running absorbable fine sutures. And then you lay that over the top and then anastomose it to the other side after placing a catheter and then support it with a running spongioplasty. And you see nice restoration of the spongiosal anatomy and that robust ventral sponge is what uh, supports this graft in a very favorable way. And here we see the postoperative imaging, which again, it's not normal, but you see minimal kind of redundancy from the graft and the bulbar urethra. Uh, and while the success rates are not as good as EPA, uh, large studies um, have shown the success rate is somewhere between 85 to 90%, which is still quite favorable for these longer, more complex urethral strictures. Um, most people's uh, uh, a preferred graft and the guidelines support as well is the buc buccal mucosa graft. This is harvested from the inner cheek, as you can see here. Um, we identify Stenson's duct notify, or not uh, indicated by this uh, a black dot, uh, usually located near the second upper molar. And then you take a full thickness, typical elliptical graft. Uh, this is very well tolerated. It's easy to handle. There's abundant oral graft from both cheeks. The lower lip can be used as well as the undersurface of the tongue. Um, the, mor the morbidity is limited. And really it's been shown time and time again to have superior outcomes to other graft sources, such as genital or non-genital skin, other uh, uh, aloe or xenografts, and other sources as well. Some of the challenges, um, this tissue might be threatened in patients that smoke or use chewing tobacco, for those that have had extensive oral surgery or radiation, or for those that have uh, really critical use um, of their oral cavities, such as the individuals that you can see here. Although I would say that it is the minority of patients that are excluded from candidacy due to even these concerns. Now, what about an even more complicated stricture? Um, this man has had, has had urinary symptoms for many years. He went into retention, had a suprapubic tube placed. We plugged the suprapubic tube and had him try to do a flow rate. And you can see uh, here that it's an abysmal flow with uh, about five milliliters per second with that flow with the uh, SP tube capped. He had a much more complicated medical history uh, with uh, uh, sexually transmitted diseases in his younger years and even Fournier's gangrene uh, later on, along with some other comorbidities. You could see the uh, stigmata of this on examination with the pale lichen sclerosis, uh, phymotic band here on his foreskin, extensive scarring of his perineum due to his prior Fournier's gangrene. And you see on his retrograde urethrogram that he has a panurethral stricture extending across the pendulous into the bulb and up toward the urogenital diaphragm. Uh, the guidelines uh, really kind of illustrate the fact that there are multiple options available for these men. Um, certainly, you, you can require one or multiple stage techniques using grafts, flaps, or a combination of both. Um, a perineal urethrostomy is certainly an appropriate option for these men uh, that consent to the, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ill effects or to the different effects of that. Um, and then if you see extensive lichen sclerosis changes within the skin, these should be biopsies, particularly if cancer um, is suspected. And in when lichen sclerosis is confirmed, it is clear that you should not use genital skin in the repairs for these patients because the likelihood of recurrence of the lichen sclerosis within the reconstruction is quite high. So for this patient, I won't spend a lot of time talking about this, but this is a technique that was popularized by Sanjay Kulkarni from India where basically the entire urethra is exposed by invaginating the penis through the perineal incision. We mobilize and rotate the urethra laterally and make a long dorsal urethrotomy along the entire stretch of the urethra. Um, and then you see two oral grafts placed um, here proximally and then distally. And then that's rotated back over and then affixed to the corpora cavernosa. And you, what you obtain by this is panurethral reconstruction through simply a perineal skin incision. And so the morbidity of this is quite less um, for a quite extensive reconstruction. And again, postoperatively, you do see some irregularity from this panurethral graft, but excellent patency. 
Um, and here's a, a, a flow study shown three months later, which confirmed good patency. And uh, no one is more experienced at this than uh, uh, Professor Kolkarni, and he's published success rates of about 85 to 90% uh, in a really amazing uh, series over the course of his career. So we've got, he's done great things to really change the game when it goes to panurethral uh, stricture reconstruction. So how do we care for these postoperatively? I think it's very important to use uh, a lot of local anesthetic, um, uh, pudendal blocks, incisional blocks. We are very aggressive with using uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories as well as Tylenol. And that has essentially eliminated the need for narcotic pain regimen, uh, regimens uh, in our experience here in the States and also facilitate same day discharge from the hospital where that is appropriate. Um, in terms of post-operative catheterization, it's great to, uh, uh, that we only need a catheter for two weeks when we do an excisional approach and then perhaps a week or two longer in patients that have more complex repairs such as those that require grafts or flaps. Um, now, I'm running out of time, but I do want to talk a little bit uh, to conclude about posterior uh, urethral stenosis. And really here, etiology is extremely important. And these are the common etiologies that we see. Um, pelvic fracture urethral injury is probably the most profound cause of this injury. Um, at the time of injury, when you do your retrograde urethrogram, you'll see this characteristic pattern of extravasation at the level of the urogenital diaphragm. In these cases, it's important to place a suprapubic tube at the time. And then when we get our imaging a couple of months later, we see a couple of things. We see the extensive pelvic hardware that was placed by our orthopedic colleagues, along with a focal but severe obliteration at the level of the bilbo membranous junction. Now, when we're evaluating these patients later, now sometimes be careful because you could be fooled by the fact that if their bladder neck doesn't open, you could, you could fool this, as the radiologist was fooled here, that a lengthy defect is actually there. But much more commonly, when we place a scope or do imaging, uh, allowing the bladder neck to open, we see that it is still complex, but much, much lower due to the fact that the bladder neck and the prostate were not involved as all, at all. Sometimes their bladder neck will not open, and so it can be helpful to place a flexible scope anagrade. And here we see a focal stenosis along with a little outpouching due to some extravasation that kind of coalesced and fortunately did not fistulize. Now, unlike anterior urethroplasty, in which in some uh, circumstances, uh, selectively endoscopic treatment can be used, really this should not be used for posterior urethroplasty related to pelvic fracture, in which case ure uh, delayed posterior urethroplasty is the mainstay. Do not use cut to the light techniques such as was shown from this historical textbook here. They do not work. They can lead to incontinence uh, and rectal injury and should be completely abandoned uh, in my experience. Um, in terms of kind of things that we wanna use uh, and uh, think about when planning for posterior urethroplasty after pelvic fracture, um, it should be performed after they've recovered from their other injuries. Here we see a patient that due to his orthopedic injuries, he could not be placed into the lithotomy position. So this patient, we just exchanged his suprapubic tube, got him in touch with his uh, orthopedic surgeon and, and uh, physical therapist to provide some more mobility of the hip to permit safe access to the perineum. And you want to be able to be able to get the thighs up. They don't need to be able to get past this vertical position, but to the vertical position is necessary. And um, I'm going to begin to kind of skip through this a little bit in the sake of time. Um, with regards to perineal exposure, I like to place a drape right over the anus indicated by the red dot that allows a midline perineal incision and a direct and straight access to the level of the membranous urethra. If you place your drape higher, you have to go down and around and that risks a more complicated dissection and perhaps even a rectal injury. So just place it over the level of the anus and that has straight access directly in. It's important to expose and excise the scar, of, uh, the plug of scar at the level of the membranous or bulbo membranous junction. And then you see the critical uh, importance of getting adequate suture placement into the membranous urethra. You can either use small needles and place them directly or Turner Warwick's technique of using a ski shaped needle can facilitate safe needle placement deep into the perineum. Um, cystoscopy, can be important to make sure you've gotten uh, to the appropriate level. 
uh, and then the classic Webster, uh, a progressive perennial approach popular, popularized by George Webster many years ago, involves a stepwise approach to bridge that gap. Uh, first, by mobilizing the bulbar urethra. Second, by splitting the corporal bodies, thus straightening and, and shortening the distance between the proximal bulb and the membranous urethra. And in some cases, we even need to resect the inferior aspect of the pubic bone as shown here with this pair of rangures. And then even sometimes the urethra needs to be rerouted behind the corporal bodies, although this is fortunately a very rarely required maneuver. Now, uh, to, to complete here, I will just say briefly that for those that have posterior urethral stenosis uh, after other causes, it's usually due to the ill effects of prostate disease treatment, oftentimes multiple treatments on top of one another. And it's for these cases in which endoscopic treatment is actually preferred. Um, patients need to be informed about the risk of failure and incontinence. And then sometimes even some adjuvant therapies at the time of endoscopic treatment, such as injections of steroids or various chemotherapeutic regimens such as mitomycin may be appropriate, although these are some of the most challenging patients that can be treated. And therein lies the, the role selectively of formal reconstruction. In the United States, at least, there's been an explosion of the utilization of the surgical robot to kind of salvage these patients, which are otherwise very difficult to treat. Um, so that was certainly a whirlwind view through the world of urethroplasty and urethral reconstruction. Um, to summarize, uh, I hope I've uh, appropriately illustrated that urethral stricture is, is common. It can be very costly. Um, and unfortunately, commonly mismanaged, certainly in the United States. Um, I hope I've illustrated that the anatomy is key to help guide our decision making, uh, the anatomy of the stricture as well as the anatomy of the urethra. And then it certainly is my assertion that uh, urethroplasty is the most safe and successful technique for the restoration of function uh, in patients that are troubled with urethral stricture. So again, I, I wanna thank Dr. Richter uh, for the invitation. I saw him log on a bit ago. Thanks, Eric. And thanks to uh, Katie and everyone at IVU Med for the opportunity. And uh, I uh, have time, if y'all have time, uh, if there are any questions or uh, discussions or comments uh, from those on, on the uh, webinar. So again, thanks very much. clicking on here to see. Looks like everybody's muted, but certainly feel free to unmute yourself if there's any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Stephen, for this very wonderful lecture. Thank you very much, Stephen, for the wonderful lecture. Thanks, Fred. Yeah, uh, I have uh, just two questions. In your experience, which is better if one is doing a bacomycosal graft in the bulb urethra to lay it dorsally or to lay it ventrally? And is there a difference in success rates? So when it's been studied, there is no difference in success rates. So I think primarily, I think it comes down to if uh, what you're more comfortable with and what, uh, where your training lies. There's no one that's better than the other. Now, um, for those that are in the process of developing these skills, um, I believe that the ventral approach is a much more straightforward operation. Um, you don't have to elevate the bulb off of the corporal bodies. It's a direct incision down into the, into the urethra and into the plate. And so given the fact that the outcomes are equivalent, um, I think that it's, I think that I would begin by becoming, uh, by using the ventral approach. And um, uh, even Dr. Barbagli, uh, our Italian colleague who really changed the game by, by popularizing the dorsal approach has even said that in many of these cases, he does ventral. And so I think that speaks a lot with when, when one of the world's experts and really the, the, the innovator of the dorsal approach uh, tells us that in many cases, he prefers the ventral approach. Now, the one exception I would say, Fred, is the reoperative scenario. So in a patient that's had perhaps a prior end, uh, uh, excision uh, and primary anastomosis that's failed, 
or a patient that has had a ventral repair that has failed, then in those circumstances, I go directly to the dorsal approach, given the fact that the graft is supported from a different source. It's no longer supported by the urethra, but rather it's supported by the corporal bodies. So I hope that uh, uh, answers your question. Yes, thank you very much. And you inadvertently answered my second question, where in Africa here, we still see uh, post gonococcal urethros pictures. And in that case, if one suspects it's post gonococcal, they are bound to be multiple, maybe occurring at different times as the patient ages. Now, in such a case, would it be wise to do excision and primary anastomosis? Or if one suspects it's post gonococcal, one should not uh, do excision and primary anastomosis, given the fact that when we do excision and primary anastomosis, we actually interfere with distal blood supply to the urethra, and it depends on the anastomosis at the glands. What's your opinion, Steve? Yeah, I, I, certainly, I certainly think for whatever reason, if at the time or in the future, uh, you, uh, you believe that the patient is at risk uh, to develop other strictures that he might require, you know, further stricture, you know, treatment down the road, um, for whatever reason, gonococcal or otherwise, definitely that's a reason uh, to consider the non-transecting uh, approach. And that may be non-transecting excision, uh, such as has been popularized uh, by Professor Zandrich and Mundy, or remembering that, uh, you know, a ventral onlay is also a non-transecting approach. And so um, I certainly think that, you know, the philosophy of non-transection is appropriate in the circumstances like you talk about, where you suspect other strictures. Um, and the beauty of non-transection is you don't burn any of the bridges, uh, so to speak. Whereas as soon as you transect the urethra, um, it does kind of uh, theoretically permanently disrupt that blood supply and could compromise those other approaches down the road. So I think that's a great point. And I agree with you that I would uh, consider non-transecting options in such a patient. Thank you very much. Thank you. I wonder whether my other colleagues have questions or additions after Steve's long lecture. Hello. Hi. Hello, Steve. Thank you for the presentation. This is Okidi Ronald. Nice to meet you. Uh, Thank you. It's such a, a wonderful presentation on something that is really very common in Africa. So, uh, as Fred, Dr. Fred has already uh, asked a few things concerning the gonococcal stricture. Um, but say in my center here, we see a lot of patients with the, with the strictures. And, and uh, the majority, the strictures is, uh, is, is on the penile urethra. And it's quite a long stricture that most times is, uh, is involving the entire um, anterior urethra. Now, my question is, uh, which technique would you really prefer? A Randy flap or a Johansen or a buccomucosal flap for such a repair of a very long anterior urethral stricture? Yeah, it's a great question. And, and uh, I applaud you for, for caring, you know, for a large group of patients that have these complex strictures. Because, I mean, I agree with you that the, the complex penile stricture due to gynecocal urethritis or other, uh, other forms of inflammation are certainly uh, the most challenging.
Um, my preference uh, is, comes a bit down to the anatomy, that I do not like placing flaps through the glands. So if the glands, meaning the, the meatus and the fossa are spared, and it's due to gynecocal infection or other non lichen sclerosis techniques or uh, uh, etiologies, I think, and it does not extend into the bulb, um, then I think either the Arandi or the Mackinich cir circular flap, if the patient has not yet been circumcised, would be my preferred technique. Now, if it involves the glands, then in those cases, I prefer using a dorsally placed buccal mucosa graft that can be using Kulkarni's, uh, Professor Kulkarni's technique can be placed through the glands without opening the glands, okay? And so in those circumstances, I much prefer to leave the glands wings intact because the, the, in my hands, placing a flap and then doing a glands plasty around the flap has a high degree or a high risk of having glands dehiscence. Now, if the patient is not concerned with the cosmetic aspects of uh, uh, either an extended Johansson procedure or a perineal urethrostomy, so namely a patient that may be more elderly, uh, that has other medical problems and does not, is not worried about the cosmetic changes, then clearly uh, an extended Johansson procedure or a perineal urethrostomy has the highest success rate. However, it has the obvious drawbacks of the cosmetic changes. So I think yours is a great question. And like I said, it, that my choice between a skin flap, a buccal graft, and a, and a urethrostomy would de depend completely on the anatomy of the stricture and the wishes of the patient. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. Thank you. Hello. Hello. Um, my question um, is what would you do for a patient who has had failed posterior? urethral surgery, like they did, uh, they attempted, but the stenosis came back, what would you do? What would be the next thing if you caught such a case in your practice? So those are among the most difficult, you know, circumstances as well. Um, what typically I've noticed uh, in patients that fail uh, posterior urethroplasty after pelvic fracture is one of two problems. Either there has been incomplete excision of the scar. So basically they made, an, you know, made a perineal incision and exposed uh, the stenotic urethra, but did not completely excise the plug of fibrosis. And so it promptly recurs because you did not good, get good mucosa to mucosa anastomosis. The other circumstance is where there has been inappropriate mobilization or inadequate mobilization of the bulbar urethra to the penis scrotal junction. And so most of the time, the patients that are referred to me for failure is one of those circumstances. And in those cases, we simply go back and do it again, but this time ensure complete excision of the scar um, adequate mobilization of the bulbar urethra, and then when needed, separation of the corporal bodies, and in rare cases, even resection of the lower aspect of the pubic bone to make sure the length uh, can, can be bridged. Now, the exception to that is the circumstance known as bulbar urethral necrosis, which Professor Kolkarne has published and uh, uh, reported on extensively where due to compromise of the retrograde blood supply, you have a much longer gap where basically the entire bulb has died. And in these circumstances, uh, which are all fortunately quite rare, a tubularized perpucial tube made from the distal, uh, the circular flap 
uh, can salvage these patients. Uh, fortunately, these are quite rare. What's much more common is due to inadequate resection or inadequate mobilization, uh, you know, as I mentioned previously. Um, I hope that's a helpful answer. Those are certainly very challenging cases to, uh, to, to dig back into. Yes, thank you. I've sent you a, I've sent you a question. I think you've seen it. Yes, I see the question. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So the question was, in my practice, do I always divert urine with a suprapubic tube before urethroplasty? Um, and my answer is no, I don't always do it. So if a patient presents only with symptoms, so they have slow flow or maybe a couple of mild bladder infections, um, but they're still emptying their bladder reasonably, um, and they have not had a catheter placed or recent attempts at endoscopy to do a dilation. In those cases, I simply book them for urethroplasty and usually are ab am able to get it done within the next couple of weeks. And there's likely no ill effects of that because the scar has not been disrupted by other degrees of instrumentation. Conversely, the, ch the times when I will definitely use a suprapubic tube is where someone presents with a catheter in place or someone who is self-catheterizing to keep it open. So I will place a suprapubic tube in those so we can allow that urethra to rest and the scar uh, to mature. Or if a patient presents to the ER in the middle of the night in retention, in those cases, um, I, I, I don't have the setup that I, nor the interest to go to the hospital in the middle of the night to attempt a urethroplasty. So those patients will have our trainees and residents place a suprapubic tube and then see them in the office a couple weeks later with the appropriate imaging and then schedule the urethroplasty. And then the final circumstance would be in the context of a pelvic fracture urethral injury where we recommend placing a suprapubic tube at diagnosis. So um, uh, I hope that answers the question. Like I said, I think that if they present and have not been instrumented and you can get them in the operating room soon, uh, then I think it's reasonable to, 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 to proceed without the suprapubic tube. Yes, Steve. Uh, we have had a number of challenges, especially in patients who have had pelvic floor urethral injuries. But sometimes we find a lot of fibrosis, especially in the, our populations here, and becomes very difficult to dissect. Well, you can dissect and you may not be able to take away all the scar tissue. You somehow do the anastomosis almost to the prostate. And a few weeks later, there is failure. And one wonders whether to go back or not. And it's a dilemma that keeps running in our minds. When should one give up? It's a difficult question for us to answer. Any guidance? Uh, yeah. I I don't have a good answer in terms of, of, of when to give up. I mean, I would say a lot of it depends on, you know, who, you know, who and what was present when the previous attempt was made. So if, if the previous attempt was made by a surgeon that was, you know, less experienced, maybe the next one can be made with, you know, one of your partners uh, or you or one of your partners that is more experienced or have two experienced surgeons present. Um, other things uh, that can be helpful is to make sure that the circumstances are perfect. So make sure that, um, you know, you've got the best lighting possible. Make sure that um, uh, you have good, you know, suction and irrigation uh, and things to give perfect visualization. To really make sure that perfect attempts, all of the variables that can be controlled for are controlled for. Um, and I've found that when all of those circumstances are right, then usually a better attempt can be made. Uh, but obviously for the very severe injuries, there'll be limits to what we can do. Um, but I've found that when you 
kind of make everything, uh, optimize everything with regards to exposure, the proper retractors, the proper lighting, suction, suture material, instruments um, that virtually, you know, from a trauma perspective at least, virtually uh, uh, every, uh, you know, every patient deserves another shot at reconstruction, despite the fact that it can be very, very difficult. I wish I could make it easier than that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Well, great. If there's uh, no other questions, again, I, I wanted to thank all of you for attending. I, I hope this was helpful. Um, and uh, again, thanks to Katie, to Dr. Richter, and to IVU Med. Um, and it really is my sincerest hope that it's not too long from now that, that uh, the world will settle down a bit and we can travel again. And I hope to meet you all in person uh, at some point in some day and we can wor work together and learn from one another in the future. So that's my greatest hope. And again, Thank you for uh, the chance to be with you today. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank yeah, you. thank you so much. This was great. Yeah. Okay. Bye bye. Thanks bye -bye. a lot. Bye. Be well. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you.